thing about Linus into war is that they're moving toward fighting the wars without ever telling us the wars are happening. And so we can be prepared for every lie. But now we have the CIA fighting wars with flying killer robots without telling us. We have special forces in up to 100 countries around the world engaged in violence, engaged in interference with other people's governments, and we're never told. Right? And so we have to figure out a way to expose the basic policies and end them. And the helpful thing about drone wars is that they look to most people, once they find out about them, more like what war always is, like murder. Right? I mean, you have, you have a young man in Pakistan attending a conference on drone, on drone strikes and drone victims and learning about it and learning how to use a video camera. And, you know, blocks away from the U.S. government and the Pakistani government, if they wanted to arrest him, they could arrest him. But he goes up into the territories to film drone victims, and they hit him with a drone strike and kill him. And teenager, you know, and we have on this kill list, by the way, if you haven't heard, the president has a list of people he kills. On it are men, women, children, Americans, non-Americans, and all of those categories have been targeted and killed, as have many, many men, women, and children in the wrong place at the wrong time, not on the list. Uh, and, and you say, well, this is this is tar this isn't targeting just anyone. This is targeting of terrorists. So this is actually more precise than war, because in the old-fashioned war, you were killing harmless recruits who were just recruited by their government and sent into the battlefield. Well, first of all, we're targeting people that we don't know their name or anything about them based on their pattern of activity, a pattern which suggests that they're resisting U.S. occupations in places like Afghanistan, not a pattern of behavior that suggests they're attacking the United States. But the vast majority of the people dying are not in that category at all. The vast majority of the people being killed are simply ordinary men, women, and children. Right? And, and so it begins, once people are willing to hear about it, to look like murder. Whether you try to excuse it as a form of war, or you try to excuse it as a form of law enforcement, it doesn't look much like either one. And we, President Obama came to Charlottesville to talk a month or so ago, and some of us helped handed out flyers and posters outside of the event uh, before going into the event and getting thrown out. And we tried to find out whether our friends and neighbors who were going in supported this kind of policy. And we found out they never heard of it. They never heard the major front page story in the New York Times, endless media coverage. The president has this kill list, this new assassination program, huge multi part story this week in the Washington Post. The exact thing that these people would have been absolutely outraged, emailing all their friends, doing actions about if the president were a Republican. So we have this selective intake of information, as well as this selective resistance based on who's doing the killing. But if, if we had a Republican in the White House, or if we were willing to read about crimes by presidents when they're Democrats, if somehow we could become aware of what this drone program is, I think it would be resisted more than ordinary war. I mean, people have sort of stopped this fantasy that there's a battlefield and come to understand that the wars are in people's homes and towns. Not ours, theirs, uh, and, and that it's murder. And making it murder on a smaller scale seems, seems to me to move us in a useful direction, even though I don't buy the argument that the drone wars are better than the other wars. Because we didn't have another war in Yemen. We went into Yemen with a drone war and created the need to send in the Marines. The drone pilots, who, by the way, sit at a desk and dress in pilot uniforms as if they're flying a plane, and drive home from work and pass a sign that says, drive carefully, it's the most dangerous part of your day. These, these guys are suffering PTSD, post-traumatic stress disorder, at a higher rate than the real pilots. Because they look at a house and they watch the people and the family and the children for days. While the family hears the drone buzzing overhead, wondering every moment for all those days when they are going to be eliminated from the face of the earth. And then he kills them, or she kills them. And they suffer.
suffer the trauma that comes with that. And the children and the adults in Pakistan and wherever, Yemen, Somalia, suffer, suffer the horrible trauma of living under that buzzing, that dot in the sky. Uh, and, and so it is a horrible, horrible form of murder. I, uh, I was talking on the way down here on the phone with a guy who said to say hi to all of you, so I take it some of you know him. His name is Elliot Adams. Oh, yeah. Uh, he was president last year of Veterans for Peace. Uh, and he and a couple dozen other brave, courageous, dedicated peace activists up in Syracuse, New York, got arrested yesterday for the umpteenth time protesting drones outside the Hancock Airfield uh, outside of Syracuse. And the new twist that Elliot and I were trying to wrap our heads around is that they haven't just charged them with trespassing or failing to obey an order or disorderly conduct or any of the things that they charge people with for trying to enforce international law against murderous drone strikes. Uh, by the way, the United Nations is now going to investigate whether murdering people with drones is inappropriate or not. And then, Nothing will happen unless we make it happen. Uh, the, the twist is that they, made, they took the name of some operations commander on the base and gave all of the demonstrators an order of protection, a restraining order, to protect this base commander from 20 nonviolent people with posters. <laughs> they are not permitted to be anywhere near his house. <coughs> But they have no idea where that is. They're not permitted to be anywhere near his school or his, you know, all these lists of places. They don't, they've never heard of the guy before. They haven't been shown a photograph of him. They don't have any idea why he, in the middle of a military base with the highest weaponry ever created by the human species, needs protection from 20 people with posters, or why he, and not the thousands of other people there, need this protection. Uh, so there's various lawsuits coming. But I think the cowardice of these individuals just cannot be overestimated. Um, and, and this is, is, again, under the Nobel Peace Prize winning president. And the Nobel Peace Prize has now been given to a continent, to the continent that plays, if not the biggest, at least the second biggest role in imposing war on the planet, right? Europe, the European Union, has been given the Nobel Peace Prize. Well, Alfred Nobel, when he created the Nobel Peace Prize in his will, which is a legally binding document, said, this is for the person, now, Europe is not a person, who during the last year, and this was a prize given for the past several decades since World War II, of Europe not going to war with itself, which, again, is an incredible development. I don't want to minimize it. Credit to the Kellogg-Briand Pact. Credit to the, the opposition to nuclear weapons. Credit to the European Union that, they, that Europe doesn't go to war with itself anymore um, outside of Yugoslavia. But Europe goes to war with the rest of the world. NATO is now a global aggressive force. You know, you ask Libya, ask Iraq, ask Afghanistan, ask Syria. You know, should, should Europe have the Nobel Peace Prize? for being the person who during the past year has done the most or best work toward eliminating standing armies from the world. The purpose of this was to fund the work of the individual who had done the most work during the past year to try to eliminate standing armies from the world. Now, if Europe wanted fewer armies and fewer weapons, it could fund that itself by buying fewer armies and fewer weapons. The absurdity of funding Europe to, to engage in creating fewer standing armies when Europe could take the money and add a little bit to one of its armies. It's just outrageous. This is, this is what we've, we've come to. We've lost this whole understanding that the evil is war, not some type of war. Right? This is just like the Carnegie Endowment for Peace, which was mandated by Andrew Carnegie to work for the elimination of war, and if they ever finished, to sit down and decide what was the second most evil thing in the world and work to eliminate that. This is an organization that now works on everything but eliminating war. Um, and I don't mean to pick out a couple organizations. I could go through all of them. Um, I, I 
I wrote a book uh, called, called Daybreak uh, a few years ago because I, I wanted to look at what was wrong with our government, what needed to be fixed, uh, and I was involved in an effort to impeach George W. Bush and Richard B. Cheney. Uh, it didn't quite succeed. And there's, a, there's another book, and it's the very last copy I have, although you can you know, get it from bookstores, uh, called The 35 Articles of Impeachment, uh, which a whole bunch of wonderful people worked with a great Congress member named Dennis Kucinich on producing. Uh, and I wrote an introduction to that. Um, this, is, this was someone just redistricted out by a weapons funded uh, Democrat in Toledo. Uh, he's in Cleveland, but they drew a district, they combined the two. Uh, he, was a, he was a great person to know and work for. I worked on his 2004 campaign. Um, but when, when we were trying to impeach Bush and Cheney, people said, oh, you just don't like them. They talk funny, they're Republicans, he's from Texas, you just, you hate, you're vicious, you're not a peacemaker, you want to punish people. And I said, listen, I have no ill will toward Bush or Cheney. This is about deterrence. This is about setting a precedent. Because if you allow, if you allow this president to get away with these things, the next president will not give up those tools voluntarily and will add to them. Guaranteed. Republican, yeah. Democrat, man, woman, this was not a, this was not a difficult prediction. And it has, of course, come true. Right? We, the things that were taboo and scandalous uh, under Bush are now open and accepted and written into so-called law. Right? The, the lawless imprisonment of people without charge or trial, which you, you can go on pretending that Obama didn't force that out of Congress, but you have to ignore the fact that his Justice Department, which obeys him absolutely, is fighting in court to, to keep that power right now. Uh, the, the warrantless spying, which is now normalized, bipartisan acceptance, uh, and will be very, very difficult to eliminate under whoever comes next. Uh, the, the renditions and torture, which have become now a policy choice, not, not crimes. The, the launching of wars without Congress. I mean, Bush bothered to lie to Congress, give him some credit. When it came to Libya, Obama avoided allowing Congress to have any say as a matter of principle, even though Congress would have bowed down and voted for that war in a heartbeat. Uh, and the murdering, the assassinating of human beings, which has been openly established, and if, you know, if there's anything more disturbing about our culture than this, tell me what it is. When, when in 2004, the New York Times had that story about warrantless spying, they sat on it for fear it would hurt George W. Bush's re-election. They didn't bring it out for a year and a half after the election. Now, immediately before an election, you have the New York Times and the Washington Post printing huge articles about the fact that the current president murders lots of people, men, women, and children around the world, including American teenagers. And it's full of quotes from top officials in the White House. They want this story there. This is not something that's been discovered by the new Woodward and Bernstein. This is being pushed to the media by the White House, which is proud of it. They're proud that they kill people. And they wouldn't be if we had stood up to them in the past four years. We shut down. We went home. We crawled under our beds. We said, we registered people to vote. We're done. Even though knocking on doors for peace and justice is way more popular than any politician you can knock on doors for, and registering people to vote is not activism. It's busy work created by an anti-democratic government. Um, so, <coughs> I, 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 because I want to answer any questions and have any kind of discussion we can, I should say something about the election looming before us, uh, because if I don't, everybody will ask about it, and they will anyway. So, um, I, I think the number one thing that elections do to us is divide us, and, and, and make us fall out with each other. Uh,
toward no particularly valuable end. Because if I stand up here and say, you better vote for Obama, lots of you will condemn me. And if I stand up here and say, you better vote for Jill Stein or Rocky Anderson, lots of you will condemn me. And we all favor the same policies. And what changes the world is not elections. Is not elections. And Emma Goldman said, if elections change anything, they ban them. She was right. <laughs> said it's not who's sitting in the White House, it's who's doing the sitting in. He was right. We can't do away with elections. We ought to create them. Gandhi was asked, what do you think of Western civilization? He said, I think it'd be a good idea. What do you think of the elections? I think it'd be a good idea. We don't have them. We don't have ballot access. We don't have media access. We don't have the ability to run candidates who aren't bought and paid for. We, we do not have credible elections. Jimmy Carter will not observe them because they don't pretend to any seriousness. We ought to have elections. We can't do without them. We're suffering because we don't have them. <coughs> but they are not what changed the world. Women didn't vote themselves the right to vote. The labor movement did not vote itself workplace rights. We didn't get the 12-hour day or the 10-hour day or the 8-hour day by voting for it. Elections are very, very unimportant, especially when you've got the choice between the evil candidate and the even more evil candidate. <coughs> because you can vote for the lesser evil candidate every time. And four years later, they're both more evil. Every time. So something else is obviously needed. And what's needed is an independent movement based around policy change rather than personality change. And so you can make this rational calculation, as some good friends of mine do, and we're going to stay friends, that in the swing states, you got to vote for the lesser evil guy if you can see a difference between the two evils. But in all the other states, go ahead and vote for a good candidate as long as you don't do it in too many numbers that it actually makes a difference. Okay? And the problem I have with that is that in those 38, 40 states where you can do that, there's not a candidate or a journalist to be found. They're all concentrated in the swing states. If you want to get a message out during the better part of a year, every four years, you have to do it in those states. And if you're going to shut down your activism for a year to push that idea of protecting the lesser evil candidate in that handful of states, you're going to take away massive energy from where it's needed in the movement. And if you're going to make a movement about protecting an evil candidate in a handful of states, it's going to be a movement year in, year out, even non-election years for that lesser evil candidate. If people didn't become lesser evil thinkers throughout the year, they would know about the drone strikes as they walked in to cheer for Obama at his rallies. They might say they could still walk in to cheer for Obama at his rallies knowing full well what they were cheering for and deciding that it served some lesser evil purpose. But they would know things that were major news stories. They don't because they think like lesser evil voters, even in non-voting years. When, when asked me, great labor union of government workers came to Charlottesville a few years ago to hold a rally about health care reform. This is a labor union that for decades supported non-profit, single-payer, universal health care. They come to Charlottesville to hold a rally and they spread the word beforehand what the rules are. No one who favors single-payer or writes single-payer on a poster is permitted. Right? Now, there was no election that year. There was no election. But this was what most Washington, D.C. activist groups do. They go and ask the elected officials, what should we ask you to do? Is it to reverse what representative government is supposed to be about? They don't go ask the people, what should we tell the government? They go ask the good team on the government, what should we tell the people to ask you for? So they become, you become a prop in a campaign rally, election year or not election year, right? And, and so because I think that our priority has to be the activist movement, and it has to be a movement against war and plutocracy and all the directional movements <coughs> that go together, uh, I would prefer to talk about more important things than elections at all. But if you force me to talk about elections, <laughs> I will tell you to vote for Jill Stein uh, because that is a candidate. Jill Stein is a candidate who opposes militarism uh, and does so very, very well. Um, 
but I have some yard signs that are free in the back that say jobs not war instead of some candidate's name. Uh, please take them and, and stick them up. Um, I also have uh, the last book I'll mention is a children's book I've just written for my little boy, and I don't know if it's any good or not, uh, but I'm starting to sell it, and you can see if you if you like it if you have kids, because I think there are way too many adventures and exciting stories and movies and books for our children that are about war or that are about violence. Uh, and I think that, that we can be even more engaging. Uh, I don't know if I've succeeded in it, but I think we can be even more engaging than that with our children who don't, who don't naturally have an interest in war. It has to be drilled into them uh, if, if we find excitement elsewhere. And his, uh, his title is? His title is Two World. Um, I, uh, I actually my, led my little boy watch Star Wars yesterday uh, because every single one of his friends loves Star Wars. When I was his age, my soccer team, if we won, the coach took us all to see Star Wars, which, which was brand new that year, so that tells you how ancient I am. And, and you know, it, 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 I, I think... I think it, it is a, an evil, evil thing, but you have to face it and understand it because it's part of our culture. I think when you create a movie where you stick masks and helmets and full body armor on one side so you can't see their faces and then you <coughs> kill them all, it teaches something very dangerous about war. There was, I'll tell one more story, and, and this is about a show that NBC created earlier this year called Stars Earn Stripes. Oh, how many how many people saw that or heard about it? Heard that. Heard it. This was a reality show, a fun and exciting game show about war, created by NBC in partnership with the US military. And so they paired up members or former members <coughs> of the US military with sort of B C level celebrities, Sarah Palin's husband, former Olympic athletes, and so on. And they are on these these two person teams to go and do war and see who can do it faster. And so they go and they, they attack a guard tower with no guard in it. They go through a field and shoot at nothing. They kick in doors and shoot cardboard figures until they're all dead. And they do all this target practice. And then they talk about it afterwards as, oh, it was the most exciting thing to get to be a real soldier. I almost died. And they, and they don't notice the whole thing None of the contestants and probably few of the viewers noticed that there's no other side. There's nobody shooting at them. There's no opponents, no victims, just cardboard at most. And I think it's, this is a really a visualization of U.S. news coverage of our wars, in which we have the report of the dead, and it's that 3% of the dead were Americans. There's no victims, no other side. They're erased from our thinking. And so RootsAction.org and many other groups flooded NBC with phone calls and emails. And not only is the show gone, but there is no sign of any similar show being produced. And the official host, uh, Wes Clark, the former NATO uh, commander, uh, was disinvited from the Democratic National Convention. And I have high hopes will never be heard from Again, so on the, on the, on the downside, uh, Ben Affleck is coming out with a new movie uh, about how glorious it is to ignorantly demonize Iran. Uh, so do what you can to, uh, to oppose that indoctrination uh, of our country. And I, I'd love to take any questions you have. And thanks for
and we'll start questions. The only other thing we like to do after the questions is be some space for announcements if you got them. And uh, those people who are actually working with organizations or if an individual active is doing something, we'd like to go quickly around before we leave to let you tell us what you're doing. So this gentleman? Okay. What, what do you have to say about the U.S. Institute of Peace? U.S. Institute of Peace? Uh, I wish that being for peace meant being against war. You know, I mean, there's this, this idea in our country that you can be for peace. You can be for peace on earth at Christmas time. You can always say you're for peace, but you can be for wars. Uh, and you can be for wars as a means toward peace. Uh, and I think that's wrong. And I think if we're going to have an institute for peace, and we're going to build this giant building they have now right next to the Lincoln Memorial as you come across the bridge from Virginia, that looks like it has either a dove or a bra on top of it. <laughs> I, 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 I think that, that that should be handed over to the legitimate peace movement that is opposed to war. <coughs> I think, I mean, I don't, I, I've never worked there. I've known about a few events they've done. I've been there once or twice. I know that they do some good work. Uh, but I've never heard of any significant effort by the U.S. Institute for Peace to oppose U.S. wars. How about the Department of Peace? Well, the, the idea of a Department of Peace was the, the next question. Uh, I, I think. I think that if we had a department that legitimately worked for peace, that would be a wonderful thing. But I think that the State Department should work for peace. I think the so-called Defense Department should be renamed the Department of War as it was until 1947 and should be drastically reduced if not eliminated. Uh, but I think we're going to have to have major reforms and a massive popular movement to compel these changes. And it, it, they could, for all I know, create a department and call it the Department of Peace, and it could be the Department of Invading Libya for Peace. And, and so it's not just, it's got to be more than just the name. Uh, this gentleman's standing, then I saw Susan's hand, and then this gentleman's another. I, I have a five-year-old grandson, and his father will not let him watch Star Wars because it's too black. And this young man is very much interested in guns. Now, what comment would you have about it? young boys being attracted to guns. And how old is your son? Uh, mine is six and a half, so make sure to tell you that. Half. Half. Um, I am not a child psychologist. I'm not offering uh, expertise here beyond what I've read and experienced. Uh, but uh, there are certainly many cases of denying and withholding something, making it more attractive. Uh, and so at some point you have to balance knowledge and awareness with understanding. And so sometimes I think it's smarter to read a story or watch a movie and stop it and talk about it and watch it some more. Uh, and I think that a huge amount of children's literature that means well, that was produced some decades back, uh, including many, many television shows, does more harm than good just because it's been produced for adults, really. Because when you have a television show that shows kids being mean to each other over and over again, and at the end of the story they're told to be nice, and there's a moral to the story, that's not how kids think. Kids learn that immediate moment and that immediate moment, and they're more of the bad ones than the good one that comes at the very end. And so I, I, I mean, so I went. People give me things when I speak at events like this. Somebody gave me a Dr. Seuss book called The Butter Battle Book. And it was about these two groups of people who go to war because one of them likes to butter bread on the top and one of them likes to butter bread on the bottom. And it made war look like great fun. You know, and then at the very end, there's some little comment about how stupid it was. And, and so you have to produce children's literature as if you're a child, not as if you're an adult. You know, so. Uh, yes, Susan. I, I just wanted to tell everyone that in North Carolina, the only writing candidate who will count is Virgil Good. So you, you basically, your choices are Obama, Romney, Gary Jack, John, Jackson, Johnson, and Virgil Good. Thank you. Um, can I say the other one I'm sure. I mean, um, Virgil Good is my former misrepresentative in Virginia's <laughs> fifth. And I, uh, I went to the debate.
debate Tuesday night this week in Chicago with Virgil, Gary Johnson, Jill Stein, Rocky Anderson, uh, and I was I was there covering it for uh, Al Jazeera, and they all, all four of them, I mean, they, from from the ones who want to make living wage and housing and health care and, and security of human rights to Gary Johnson who wants to eliminate taxes at the Department of Education and everything. Uh, they all of them agree on militarism and war and civil liberties. They all want to repeal the Patriot Act, restore the right not to be spied on and assassinated and imprisoned and, and, and dramatically cut military spending. Gary Johnson wants to cut it 43%. Jill Stein and Rocky Anderson want to cut it 50%, and Virgil Goode claimed he wanted to cut it but wouldn't say how much. But when Virgil Goode was our congressman, my friends would get arrested all the time sitting in his office trying to get him to not go for war funding. And he always did. He always did, just as did the Democrat who followed him, just as has been doing the Republican who followed him. We have